at Dialogue on Compassion. Um, a little bit about the Center of Compassion first. It was formed in uh, 2018 under the leadership of our previous dean, Dr. Mary Alice Donius, who we believe is listening remotely. Hello, Mary Alice. The mission of the Center for Compassion is to examine concepts of compassion from multidisciplinary perspectives within the context of a rich of, array of ideas and models of practice found in spiritual intellectual traditions. This dialogue will is emanating um, and including a nursing perspective, but we are really um, emphasizing all perspectives on um, compassion, both at this university and globally. Today's theme is compassion, a global perspective. The format today will involve two initial speakers um, and will be followed by a moderated discussion. So I'm honored to welcome both our panel who are sitting in the audience um, and our featured speakers. Um, on the screen is uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Kristoff, who will be our first speaker. Um, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times. And we're also honored to have Sarah Horton, uh, I'm sorry, say your last name, Sarah? Deutsch, Sarah Horton Deutsch, who is in our audience. Um, and she is um, gonna bring us a nursing perspective from the Watson Caring Science Institute. After the featured speaker's presentations, we will meet our panel and have time for some Q&A from those, both those present here in the room and those who are joining us remotely. We do have a hard stop at about 3 p.m. because there is another event that we'll be starting shortly thereafter for many of um, the leadership group, and we will need to attend a DEI safe space listening session event. And for those of you that are here that would like to, to uh, join that from the leadership at Sacred Heart, room 120 has been reserved for anyone that would like to move easily from this event to that event. But again, a warm welcome from the Davis and Henley College of Nursing. Um, and I will hand it over to our hosts, Dr. Karen Baus and Dr. Sue Goncalves. And at the closing of this event, if you stay to the very end, we have some exciting news and an announcement uh, for everyone regarding the Center for Compassion and an opportunity. So Karen, thank you. Hey everybody, um, welcome to those of you in the room and welcome to those of you attending remotely and a special shout out to uh, Mary Alice uh, Donius. So I'm going to introduce uh, our keynote speakers. First of all, will be Nick Kristoff and then Sarah, and then Nick will speak. Uh, Nick will have to leave after his talk. He um, has another engagement and then Sarah will talk and then um, Sue will introduce our panel participants. So let me start by introducing Nick. Uh, Nick Kristoff is a journalist, author, and political commentator who has reported and written columns for the New York Times for many years. Nick is the recipient of two Pulitzer Prizes for journalism, one of which he shared with his wife, Cheryl Wu Dun, for international reporting of the Tiananmen democracy movement in China when he was the Beijing bureau chief for the Times. Nick and Cheryl were the first married couple to win a Pulitzer for journalism. Nick won a second Pulitzer for columns about mass atrocities in Darfur, Sudan. He's received an Emmy for a video about COVID-19 hospital wards and has won other humanitarian awards such as the Anne Frank Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Nick and Cheryl have written five books, including Tightrope, which I just finished reading and so did Sarah, about American inequality and how to fix it. Nick grew up on a farm in, it's Oregon, right? I'm told Nick, two syllables for, for it's not Oregon, it's Oregon. So Nick grew up on a farm in Oregon where he still lives, graduated from Harvard, studied law at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and then studied Arabic in Cairo. He was a longtime foreign correspondent for the New York Times and speaks several languages. Nick has traveled to more than 160 countries. I shared this with Amanda, who is our second degree accelerated nursing student. She's been to 20 countries. So I said, she's got a few more to go to catch up uh, to Nick. So Nick left the Times in 2021 to run for governor of Oregon. And I remember Nick, when you wrote about this in your column and you said one of the many reasons you wanted to run for governor because you were so distressed 
by the handling of the opioid epidemic and how that devastated so many people in the town where you grew up and so many of your childhood friends unfortunately died of deaths of despair. And so Nick decided he wanted to do something about that and uh, ran for, wanted to run for governor, but a little thing about residency got in the way. So he was disallowed because of residency and then came back to reporting for the Times for which I was, um, I was quite happy. Uh, we are so happy Nick is able to join our fifth annual dialogue to share his thoughts on the need for compassion worldwide. Considering what he has seen and reported on, Nick makes a compelling witness to this global imperative. And just before I introduce Sarah on a personal note, I've been reading Nick's columns for years. Um, I find them very compelling because he writes about everything under the sun, both domestic issues such as the opioid crisis and gun violence, but he's also written from far flung corners of the word about democracy in India, about human trafficking around the world. And, you know, it, it, Nick, you always leave us with something at the end of your column, so a glimmer of hope that we can do better, not only should do better, but we can do better. And um, you are the only New York Times columnist I read on a regular basis. My apologies to David Brooks. Okay, uh, Sarah. Dr. Sarah Horton Deutsch, uh, before I introduce her, I wanna tell you all that she was personally recommended by Dr. Jean Watson, who was one of our first keynote speaker five years ago. Sarah has led in academic and practice settings for 35 years as an advanced practice, psychiatric mental health nurse, teacher, practitioner, consultant, program director, caring science endowed chair, coach and academic practice partnership director. In 2020, she was inducted into the Global American Holistic Nursing something um, through her academic and practice career. She has contributed to evidence and practice-based knowledge development to ensure compassionate, safe, and quality care. As a reflective leader, she focuses on being inwardly sound and other focused to influence change positively. She has co-authored a number of books on reflective practice, caring science, and Caritas coaching. She is a Caritas coach, heart math trainer, Reiki practitioner, and healing circle facilitator. Through her journey, Sarah has learned the necessity of connecting to one's own inner sources of wisdom, power, and healing, as well as the arts and humanities that once defined the discipline of nursing. She is passionate about facilitating critical, deep, and authentic connections that support renewal and the profession's evolution. She has a new book, Visionary Leadership in Healthcare, published in 2023 through Sigma. She is currently on the board of directors of Sigma and is co-director of the Caritas Leadership Program for the Watson Caring Science Institute. So as you can imagine, we are thrilled to have Nick and Sarah speak. And so Nick, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, well, thank you so much. And I'm delighted to be here with Sarah and with all of you. Um, I just wish I was actually physically there. My apologize for, for being about 3000 miles away, but um, I thought that I would talk a little bit about the road that I've taken, uh, things I've kind of learned along the way, and try to leave you with a little bit of that glimmer of, of hope that uh, Karen mentioned. Um, and I should say that, you know, right now I'm often sort of associated with uh, reporting on humanitarian issues, um, social justice issues. But when I began at the New York Times way back in uh, ancient history, 1984, I was actually covering international exchange rates and uh, global trade uh, issues like that. And it, um, uh, I mean, partly that's because that's where the job was, but also, um, uh, you know, it really was my reporting over the years and seeing things that uh, that that tended to uh, gravitate me toward the kind of issues that I tend to write about more. And in particular, after I became a foreign correspondent and I saw the uh, human toll 
of uh, policies of our countries or other countries, then uh, that left a deep impression on me. It wasn't something so much that I learned intellectually that propelled me to these areas, but really more what I saw in front of me. And I think that uh, that is true of many people. You know, in particular, I was on Tiananmen Square in 1989 when the Chinese troops opened fire on the uh, protesters uh, there, the pro-democracy protesters, and they shot people in the crowd that I was in uh, and all around me. That leaves a deep impression on you when you see a government use a modern army to crush pro-democracy protesters. And uh, then uh, as a, and I was sort of migrating in that direction, then as a, as a columnist, I heard about um, human rights abuses, mass atrocities in the Darfur region of Sudan in the early 2000s. I made what I thought would be one trip there. And um, again, I could not believe that you had a modern government that was sending troops and even aircraft to slaughter people based on uh, their ethnicity and and uh, and talking to I, I remember on you know I think it was on my very first trip uh, Darfur is a very arid area and so you have to go to wells to get water for the family and they're few and far between the Janjaweed militia that was doing the killing would station themselves by the wells and if a man would show up from one of these three ethnic groups they were targeting, they would kill him. If a woman showed up to get water, they would rape her. And so I was with these families who were hiding miles away, and they were sending their very young children with donkeys miles across the desert to the wells because sometimes the Janjui did not bother the young children. And seeing these families and their fear and terror as they sent their young children who were the age of my young children then uh to get water that i got back to the us and i hugged my kids and i could not get that out of my mind that uh, process and then that led me to cover other humanitarian crises abroad uh the massacres of the rohingya in myanmar and uh you know famine aids etc cetera, etc cetera. um but one issue that I think often comes up is why we should worry about crises at home when we have, uh, why we should worry about uh, crises abroad when we have real issues at home that we need to address. You know, shouldn't we solve the problems in our own backyard first? And here's how, here's what I say when, when people ask me about that. Um, it's true that we have real uh problems at home and i think we would have better moral standing to address uh, uh, repression abroad and poverty abroad if we did a better job uh addressing it right here at home um but i think it's also true that we have the bandwidth to try to make a difference inconsistently imperfectly abroad and also do the same at home they don't have to be to the exclusion of one or the other and uh, you know at the in the 1930s and 40s we were a much poorer nation than we uh, are now but uh we it was you know certainly wrong to ignore the holocaust for example uh, as it was brewing uh, i think likewise it was wrong in 1994 to ignore the rwandan genocide and here and there where we have actually taken steps we can show we've shown that we can make a uh a difference again not always not all the time not for everyone but sometimes uh, i'm about to uh, go to sierra leone next month and sierra leone as you may remember was torn apart by civil war and conflict had uh, one of the shortest life expectancies in the world because of that brutality you had militias that were cutting off people's arms and um the 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 british uh with a small force of a few hundred people managed to evict that warlord and bring peace and stability to Sierra Leone. Um, that doesn't always come at the point of a sword, but uh, there are ways we can make a difference. Uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, our empathy and our compassion shouldn't depend on somebody's skin color or their passport color. Um, 
that said, I think that sometimes, maybe especially among young people, among university students, it has become cool to go and volunteer abroad in a way that it's not always cool to volunteer or engage in efforts uh, on the other side of tracks in one's own hometown. And I think that's likewise uh, short-sighted. We have real needs at home and real needs abroad. And um, what somebody chooses to address will depend on their background, their interests. Uh, but I, I think we should avoid pitting them uh, against each other. The other thing that I that really struck me covering Darfur was, boy, I've got to say it was frustrating. I, I, yeah, I made trip after trip after trip. I saw villages that had been massacred, and I would write these columns, and it just felt like they were just disappearing without a ripple. And that led me, and I'm sure some of you were in New York then, uh, around 2004, 2005, and you may remember that um, there were a couple of red-tailed hawks that were living. Uh, on a building just off Central Park. They had their nest there. The The male hawk was called Pale Male. I forget what his bride's name was, but they had left these bird droppings and the building was upset with their nest and dismantled their nest. And all of a sudden, all of New York City is up in arms about these two homeless hawks. And I thought, how is it that I can't generate the same outrage about hundreds of thousands of people being slaughtered and driven from their homes as people feel for these two hawks. And, and that led me to the work in social psychology and neuroscience about what makes us care uh, to try to frame my reporting in ways that would actually drive more action. And it turns out there's been a lot of research on this and that it comes down to a couple of things. And you know, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but uh, uh, yeah, most fundamentally, it depends on two things. And first, it depends on an emotional connection, not a rational connection. Our compassion is an emotional process. The parts of the brain that are affected are, are emotional ones. We are, in a sense, hardwired to have empathy uh, as an evolutionary process, uh, but it's empathy for some particular individual in front of us, not for a class of people. Um, we uh, And so it starts with feeling some bond with a particular person, a particular story. And we all sort of know that as numbers go up, uh, then it becomes harder to build that emotional connection. What the research finds is that the compassion diminishes the moment N goes, it's not to 1,000 or 1 million, the moment N goes from 1 to 2, then that bond diminishes. And so that's why very often in writing uh, about these issues, I start with a story of a single child, a single person. And then once that bond is formed, then I try to back out and provide the larger uh, context. And the other lesson from this research is that people want to be part of something positive. They want to see that if they do get engaged and donate or volunteer, whatever it may be, that there can be a better outcome. And when things are simply presented as being just impossibly dire, they don't really want to be a part of it. And I think that too often we in journalism and in the nonprofit community and well-meaning people in general, that we focus so much on all that is going bad that we don't adequately offer people a ray of hope that if they get engaged, they can make a difference. And so that's why in my writing, I very often you know, plumb the depths of things that are going badly, but also try to offer that uh, that art to encourage people. Well, I uh, uh, as I was returning from, uh, you know, I, I would see the, I would cover these humanitarian crises abroad, and then I would be uh, returning home to salve my spirits here on the family farm in Oregon, and I found a humanitarian crisis unfolding uh, here at home. Um, the town that I grew up in, uh, Yamhill, Oregon, it's a small farming town. The economy traditionally was dependent on agriculture, timber, and small manufacturing. The biggest uh, employer was a glove factory. There were a lot of folks who didn't um, have, you know, certainly the great, great, great majority of people had not gone to college. Many had not gone through high school, and that had worked pretty well through the 20th century. But then uh, when those blue collar jobs left, uh, there was something of a, of a catastrophe that unfolded for those folks. Uh, meth arrived at around the same time. 
people became addicted, they got criminal records, they became even less employable, uh, they became less marriageable, uh, children were raised in, you know, this very sort of unstructured, uh, loose arrangements. Uh, principal once said that the children were growing up feral. And it was kind of heartbreaking uh, to see the, you know, the five kids who got on the school bus right after me, we write about this in, in, in tightrope. Uh, the five kids who got on the school bus right after me were um, the, the five nap kids. Uh, Farland Knapp was the oldest. He was my classmate, very bright kid, great carpenter, smart, charming. Uh, then his brother, Zeeland, uh, his brother, Nathan, their sister, Regina, and their baby brother, Keelan. And, um, you know, they were kind of emblematic of what unfolded when those good jobs went away. Uh, Farland, uh, not, not one of the Knapps graduated from high school. Uh, they all self-medicated when they struggled to get jobs. Farland uh, ended up uh, dying of liver failure from drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, his brother Zeeland died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. His brother Nathan blew himself up cooking meth. Their sister Regina uh, died of hepatitis from IV drug use. And the baby brother Keelan, he, when we wrote Tightrope, he, he had survived because he had been in the Oregon State Penitentiary for uh, 13 years, but then he was released. Uh, he lost his job on the eve of the pandemic. And uh, a month later, um, his girlfriend uh, came home and uh, found he had died of an overdose. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just the naps. Overall, at this point, uh, more than a third of the kids on my old school bus are gone from these deaths of despair, drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And I don't think that we as a nation have adequately addressed the mortality or morbidity that we see, the just how many folks have been left behind, how much pain there is in so many homes across the country. When I speak about this, inevitably people come up after me and in a low voice, they talk about how their sister or their child or their aunt uh, is uh, wrestling with addictions uh, maybe homeless. And um, I don't think that whether it's journalists, policymakers, uh, uh, politicians, that we have uh, focused adequately on this. You know, I spent a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan covering those wars. I think that was important. But uh, every three weeks, we lose more people from drugs, alcohol, and suicide than we lost in 20 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I don't think we've given that issue the attention or the resources uh, that it uh, deserves. Well, what do we need? Um, I think a starting point uh, is uh, that compassion that we are trying to highlight today, uh, that empathy. Um, I think that that has been harder to come by in a very polarized uh, uh, political environment. And um, I think we're much too quick to offer pointed fingers and not helping hands. Um, you know, one of my uh, one of my favorite uh, stories is of a, a, a teacher in, uh, well, uh, a, a, a guy in the Deep South who uh, grew up um, uh, his name is Ollie Neal. He he was um, a black kid in the 1950s, and uh, he uh, was kind of a trouble kid. He was always getting in trouble, very smart, but always giving problems to his teachers. And he um, he was not a reader. Uh, and then one day he's in the library, and uh, he sees a book uh, with a uh, cover that kind of grabs him. And he thinks, well, maybe I should read that. But he looks over at the at the counter and there's a girl in his grade. He can't be seen checking out books. So Ollie puts it in his pocket and walks out with the with the book. He steals it. Well, he reads it at home. It's the first novel that he's read and um, he really enjoys it. So a week or so later, he, um, you know, sneaks it back into the library, puts it on the shelf and he sees another novel by the same author, uh, Frank Yerby. So he steals that book <laughs> and takes it home again. It's a, just a great read. And um, so he eventually returns it and he sees a third Ollie, uh, a third Frank Yerby novel. He steals that. 
And this turns him into a reader. Ollie Neal um, begins reading everything he can get his hands on. Uh, and from this segregated black school in the 1950s, uh, he manages to uh, go on to the University of Arkansas. He later goes on to law school, becomes one of Arkansas's first African-American lawyers, eventually a, a highly respected judge. And um so he's a hero in the community. One day he meets Mrs. Grady again, the, the librarian, and he says, you know, Mrs. Grady, um, I've got a confession to make. I stole some of your books. And Mrs. Grady says, look, Ollie, I have a confession to make, too. I saw you steal that first book. <laughs> and Mrs. Grady explains that she had just been so angry at him. You know, here's this kid who's always causing trouble, and now he's stealing books. So she's about ready to march over and, and yell at him. When she understands in this flash of compassion that he's embarrassed to be seen checking out books. And so she lets him steal that book. And then in hopes that he will then become a reader, she drives that weekend 70 miles to Memphis to the used bookstores there to try to find another novel by Frank Irby. She buys it with her own money puts it back on the shelf. And when Ollie Neal steals that second uh, Frank Irby book, she is thrilled. <laughs> and then she repeats it all over again. And she can't remember whether it happened three times or four times. But, you know, the fact that you had this woman who had every reason to be indignant at Ollie Neal and to yell at him and stop him. And instead, she somehow found this willingness to give him a chance, to give him a shot. Uh, you know, that's that that. That frames empathy and compassion to me. But I guess I'd also say that empathy is not enough. Uh, you know, it's a starting point, but it's not enough. We need evidence-based policies. Good intentions are not enough. And in the field of medicine, you know, you all know that better than anything. Uh, you know, think back to when well-intentioned doctors brought out leeches. Um, I have a friend who is a professor of history of obstetrics, and he, he thinks that doctors probably did uh, more harm than good until about the year 1900 in terms of delivering uh, babies, killed as many women as they saved. Um, so we have to focus on what works, on evidence. And um, I think that there's been an explosion of evidence over the last 15 uh, years or so. I think we now kind of have a sense of what works. We've, you know, astonishingly, we reduce child poverty by half. That's just extraordinary. And I think it's we're too quick sometimes to blame industrialization uh, and mechanization for problems. Look, other countries don't have these same issues to our degree with uh, addiction, with people left behind. Um, so we have that. We have the evidence of what will work imperfectly. Um, and let me... Um, and so... What we need is that compassion, that empathy to adopt those policies. We have the policies, we have the resources. What we need is that political will to move forward. And I guess one reason why I am optimistic is that in my career, I've seen real progress. Um, you know, when uh, I graduated from college, 41% of the world's population suffered from extreme poverty. Now we're down below 10%. Uh, the number of children dying before the age of five has plummeted. Um, when I was a kid, a majority of the world's population had always been illiterate. Now we're approaching 90% adult literacy. Um, in this country, you know, if you think about homelessness, it's about as obdurate, as difficult a problem as there is. But when we were embarrassed enough about, uh, about veteran homelessness, then we took that on in the Obama administration. And we were able to reduce veteran homelessness by half. If we showed that same political will to reduce child homelessness by half, yeah, I think I think we could do it. Um, teen pregnancy, you know, there you, you think uh, that's about hormones. What can we possibly do about that? We've reduced uh, teen pregnancy by more than sixty percent since the modern peak in nineteen ninety one. The climate change, again, uh, I mean, it's certainly not a problem we have licked, but for the first time in the last year or so, I felt that you can just maybe see a path forward out of the mess that we're in. Um, so we have the policies, we have the resources, because other countries managed to do this. 
And I think what we need is that political will. And that, in turn, is going to come from empathy and compassion and from events like this. And uh, so thanks very much. And I just apologize that I'm not able to stay longer and engage with all of you. But um, I, um, I hope to hear from Karen what some of your thoughts are on this. Just getting my slides set up, but um, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here. And I want to thank you for being here because I know you're here because mm -hmm. you care deeply. So, so thank you for being here. I, like Nick, grew up in a small town of uh, what was a metropolis compared to Umville, where he's from, of a thousand. I grew up in a town of 7,000 in southern Indiana. Oh, grew up in a town of 7,000, a farming town. Um, but we've had the same. Um, drug and alcohol and meth issues um, and suicide issues. And uh, it's been heartbreaking, heartbreaking to see what's happened to my small community. So I highly recommend reading Tightrope <laughs> if you haven't read it. Thank you. So I want to start today. Jean couldn't be here today, and she asked me to be here with you. And um, I want to give you um, Jean's voice to start because um, it always um, brings us in into an emotional, heartfelt space. Often we hear about burnout, but increasingly we learn that the burnout is not because we care too much. It's because we wall ourselves off and close off our heart close off our very source of love. And the human connectedness that gives us the life generating force for this work. Why are we in this field? When it often seems that we are just there to fix the body, to give physical diagnosis and treatment. Healing is much more than that, much more of what it's about comes down to us through the ages from our ancestors and the wisdom traditions that call us into this work. And that's about honoring our very presence, our connectedness with another person in a given moment. And it is that caring moment that actually can be a critical turning point in my life, in your life, and in another person's life, as we touch another person's humanity. if we revisited the very foundation of our work and began to honor the deep, rich beauty of our humanity. that must again flourish. Because this is what healing is about. And what if we realize that this is sacred work? And it's sacred because we're working with the life force of another person as well as ourselves on this shared journey. 
What if we began to pause and to realize that maybe this one moment with this one person is the very reason we are here on Earth at this time. Any health practitioner today is struggling to return to the very human depths of our work. And we know that when we are connecting with another person in this deep way, even if it's for a brief moment in time, that we have much more purpose in our life and in our work. And we know that when that's missing, there's an empty void, and we're dispirited. And we also know the same thing happens with patients. When we hold them in their wholeness, we're holding their healing for them and we are helping to sustain them when they are most vulnerable. And as we sustain another person, we're also sustaining ourselves. This work is a spiritual practice. When we touch another person physically, we're touching more than just their body. We're touching their mind, we're touching their heart, we're touching their very soul. And when we look into the face of another person, we look into the infinity and the mystery of the human soul. And when we look into the mystery and the infinity of the human soul, it mirrors the infinity and the mystery back into our soul. And that's what connects us with this infinite field of universal love that we draw upon in our caring and healing practices. So I offer this as a blessing for you and your work in the world and in your heart as you open to the love that you have to give and to the purpose of your calling into this noble and ancient profession. video is over a decade old and it is as relevant today as it was when it was created. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I like after you watch a video of that to pause and check in with your with your heart, with your mind, and with your body. Um, and so think about what were your thoughts as you watched that video? What did you feel? And how do you want to act? Thank you. Jean talks about sacred moments of care and um, how we create sacred moments of care is, is to be fully present and to be in that caring moment. And caring science, which I'll show you a little bit more in the, in the moment, talks about um, being fully present. And that, as it said in the video, we may be here at this one moment at this one time is why we're here on earth. So I invite you, um, we invite our students to engage in micro practices of caring science where we ask them to pause before they go into a patient's room to set an intention to bring themselves and to be fully present for the patient and not be distracted so that we can attune to what's going on with them fully and be aware that we have the power to be a healing environment. Sometimes we have to hold another person's healing for them when they can't do that for themselves. And we can't do that if we're not fully present. And we have so many external forces drawing us away from being present in any given moment, most notably our cell phones, but, um, but also computers and technology. We now have computers in, in patient rooms now that draw our eyes away from, from the person that we're there to care for. So we offer a practice of pause to be fully present and then take a moment to be at peace when we leave the patient's room um, to know that we've done what we can in that moment to be compassionate towards ourselves and another to know that we may not be able to resolve all the issues or address all the patient's concerns in that moment, but that we've done what we can at that time. So we offer a simple micro practice of pause, presence, and peace in order to maintain a a sense of care and compassion. And um, caring science really invites us to be that vessel, to be that container for which um, all things can flow through, but we don't have to hold on to things. We don't have to carry those burdens. And in order to maintain our sense of resiliency, um, we, can, we can hold something um, but we can also allow it to move through and not stick and get stuck. So for me, caring science um, gives me a grounding and a foundation and, and a rooting. Um, I'm at a Jesuit school and I'm there for a reason. I'm there because of the values of that organization and institution. I've worked for private institutions and public institutions, but I've chose very intentionally to be to be where I am. Um, I chose to be on the board of Sigma or at least to run for the board of Sigma because of love, courage and honor, because those means mean something to me. And so um, I commend you here that you are a Catholic institution deeply rooted in values and ethics with a very strong mission that, um, that drives you, that allows your classes to be a little bit smaller so that you can be more connected to your students and to be the healing environment for them. If, uh, if I want, when I quit providing direct patient care a few years ago, I realized that I, I can provide as much care to my students as I would like them to care, the care that care to be transmitted then to their patients. And so all of my students know how much they are loved and cared for. I've had three calls from students today since I've been here. <laughs> And we talk it out. They're graduate students. They don't call me night and day, but they know that if there's something important, they can contact me and they can call me and I'm there for them. They're graduate students in leadership programs and they're in very, very stressful environments. Um, during COVID, they were pulled into direct patient care. I have one student that lost seven family members. And so we turned our classroom spaces into healing spaces because I knew if I had to create a healing space for them so that they could create a healing space for the nurses on the unit and for the patients. So we, we as nurses um, need to learn to be a vessel, to be a vessel, but not to um, allow things to stick, but to flow through us. This is a recent article that just came out last month. I was so pumped when I saw this. These are, um, these are 
Norwegian researchers. Um, but there's a lot of caring science research being done in um, the Norwegian countries. And um, they talk about caring with compassion and that to really differentiate between empathy and compassion. When I was in nursing school in the 1980s, we didn't talk about compassion at all. We only talked about empathy. But empathy was that one foot in and one foot out and remain that sense of objectivity by having a sense of of care for another person. And I love um, this model of compassion because it talks about compassion me, being made up of sympathy, empathy, and altruism. This makes so much sense to me. When I ask you to reflect after the video, I ask you to connect in with your head and your heart and your body or your hands. And that's what this model is made up of. Um, our sympathy is what comes from our heart it's our kindness, our warmth, our empathy is what comes from our head. It's our interest and our ability to listen. But altruism is what Nick talks about, is what propels us to, to action. It is where we move in caring science toward sacred action. Um, if that doesn't work for you, it's where we can come into morally informed actions in the world. So, so sympathy, empathy, and altruism is what creates caring with compassion. I think this is something all of our, our students need, need to learn and embrace and practice. So these, um, Armand goes on to talk about the basic concept in, of caring as an, an ontology, a way of being. And it is that carative, that love and care together, which Jean calls caring science. And it's a concept of practice. Um, and it's a way of um, being that didn't, then drives our doing, one inf um, informs the other. And, um, and finally, it's a concept of evidence. And I loved it when I saw that word evidence, because isn't that what we're always asked to do, um, provide evidence-based care, right? So now um, we can speak the empirical language of um, that drives healthcare is here's the concept of evidence. So the evidence comes through our pedagogies when, when we talk about communication, relationships, presence and dialogue we, in relationship to empathy. With sympathy, we, we see evidence through an atmosphere of warmth, concern, care, and meeting. And altruism comes from active care for well-being and relief of suffering. Um, finally, some other Norwegian researchers um, have um, published an article um, based upon their research on the qualities of a compassionate nurse. So if you haven't um, seen this article, um, it talks about um, what all makes up a compassionate nurse. So it's, um, I won't read all these to you, but you can see that empathy and communication and body language, the small acts, the small acts, which is, are those caring moments, right? It could be maybe holding someone's hand, offering them a glass of water with um, good eye contact and, and intention, um, but to bring our full presence into care. So, um, so all of these are um, so important to build a compassionate nurses. And then when we bring compassion and Caring science together. Caring science is a, a philosophy, a philosophy that um, is based upon relational care for the whole person. And it's based on that moral foundation of love and compassion. It's an ethic, an ethic at a basic human level that deserves dignity and care. An ethic of belonging that, that when I treat you then less than human. I'm not only hurting you, but I'm minimizing myself and making myself less human. So it's that, that ethic of belonging and connectedness. And finally, it's a practice. And the practices come through um, the 10 Caritas processes that fr frame living from and working from a heart-centered consciousness. It's that, that deeper way of being with and um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the 10 Caritas processes. Um, in the Caritas Coach Program, um, where uh, 
nurses have an opportunity to spend six months on their own self-discovery and journey through caring science. Um, they have a project to complete 90% of them focused on care task process one, number one, which is all about learning to care for ourselves. And I realized that we don't spend a lot of time in nursing education teaching nurses, nursing students how to care for themselves. I don't know if you're doing any better in PT or OT, but um, what I learned is that um, we really need that. So when I got to USF, the first thing I did was develop an elective course because I couldn't get the undergraduate program faculty to agree um, to make this a, a, a required course, but it's called Wellbeing, Mind, Body, and Spirit. And it's now, offered um, every semester with a wait list. And it's just also offered to um, health sciences students, not just nursing students. So I've been um, fielding calls um, and emails all week with the wait list that we have once again. And um, students are starving for practices on how to care for themselves. And um, it's, it's a very transformational course. I'll talk to you more about it in a moment, but um, if you haven't, aren't familiar with the 10 Caritas processes, it's really um, all about our ontology, our way of being, and how that can form a basis of how we show up and are with others. Um, some of the ones that drive me forward are, um, where's it? Five is promoting and accepting positive and negative feelings that we are so, um, we've been so pressured in, in education um, towards evidence-based practices and fixing and and um, and helping that we have forgotten about serving, <laughs> and so much of what nursing is about is about about serving. It's what healthcare professions are about. They're about serving, and so care test process number five emphasizes um, accepting positive and negative feelings and being okay to be with silence and just be with a patient. We don't have to fix it. Is it Rachel Naomi Remen that says, when we fix, we see something is broken. When we help, we see someone is weak. And when we serve, we see someone is whole. So I think we need to bring wholeness back into nursing education. We've, we've been exclusively almost in the four universities I've worked at, we've been focusing on, um, on helping and fixing, but we, where, where's our service? And most, a lot of times that's enough, <laughs> especially, um, in palliative care and hospice care, mental health, those are areas, um, emotional distress. So caring or care test consciousness and literacy um, are about that deeper work. It's, um, it's not that evidence-based practice isn't important. Evidence-based practice is incredibly important. But um, my experience is we've focused on that almost to the exclusion of the ontology of care and the caring consciousness and the caring literacy, the deeper form of um, care that comes from attending to our ways of being. When we think about our literacy, we don't think about a chief complaint, we think about a concern. Our language changes. Our language has become so medicalized and depersonalized and compartmentalized in, in the last 20 years. And so, um, and when we do that, as Jean says in the video, we, we reduce human beings to parts and in their whole, but we have to see people in their wholeness. And so caring literacy invites us to think about the language that we use every day. Um, we were I was on a call with Jean last month and we were talking about a new program we're developing and someone said, yes, we've got to do these training modules. And Jean said, we're not dogs. We're not training anyone. So <laughs> it's, but we, we do that all the time, right? We, we fall upon these, um, these, this language that's the dominant discourse, but we have, we're invited to change that language. Um, and so this slide is really about rebalancing. I'm challenging all of us to rebalance the being with the doing in our educational pursuits. And I'm sure that as a faith-based institution that you are way ahead of many of your colleagues at other universities, but, um, but we, all of us, have had tremendous external forces moving us away from the ontology of being. And so I think we have a tremendous opportunity um, post-COVID. We, we realize how short we fell because we, we didn't have that ontology of being grounded and rooted in, um, 
in our care for ourselves, in our care for our nursing students, um, in the care for patients, and, and things fell apart, right? Things fell apart. So that ontology of being, um, it, it means re-embracing the arts and humanities, bringing the arts and humanities back in into our educational pursuits with um, our students. I have students, when they write a paper, they, they submit something artistic with it. It can be a poem, it can be a song, it can be a drawing, but um, there's not an, we have, in every course I teach, there's an artistic component to it. Um, and, um, and lots of reflective practice. Fortunately, we um, are bring, there's an invitation to bring reflective ba practice back into nursing education through the new essentials. And, and because we know that chat GPT is going to replace us in many areas. <laughs> so we've got a bit more creative and ask um, different sets of questions, right? Um, we, um, there will be a lot of technology that will replace the human component, but, but what we can bring forth is the human component. And we need brighter students and we need to be brighter so that we can critique that um, technology, that we can inquire, we can have a higher consciousness, we can look at the fundamental nature of things, we can dialogue, we can debate. Um, so we need um, students that don't aren't constantly seeking one right answer because we're asking a multiple choice question that has one right answer, but that, that we're able to see nuance and that we help them to see nuance. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Kristen Neff's book on self-compassion. Um, she's sort of like Brene Brown 2.0, I think. Uh, but um, she talks about, I use this in the wellness course that I teach with a colleague. Um, we use this book and there's learning activities at the end of each, each chapter. And um, the art of self-compassion comes from self-kindness. I had no idea how hard our students were on themselves when I came. And I started, it was because we weren't asking those questions. But once we started asking the right questions, we started seeing how much, um, how hard they are on themselves, how much shame they come into nursing school with, how, um, how critical they are of themselves. So, um, and that's where, when we start teaching self-kindness is how we can move towards compassion. That we begin to spend time looking at our common humanity and they were all imperfectly, and it's perfectly imperfect to be imperfect, right? We all are. And then mindfulness, where we can develop that sense of self-awareness, that emotional intelligence, that, that ability to be calm even within a storm, and that there can be all sorts of chaos going on around us, but that doesn't mean we have to be chaotic. So these are the assignments that we have um, in this course, this wellness course. This DEAL paper, if you're not familiar with the DEAL paper, it stands for Describe, Examine, and Articulate Learning. And I think it's the most well-developed evidence-based um, narrative learning approach. And I've, um, it was developed by Ash and Clayton. Um, Ash, I think, is from Michigan. And um, Clayton is actually from um, originally from Indiana, where I'm from, and how I learned about this assignment. But there's a rubric about it for it. Um, we aligned it to the 10 Caritas processes. Um, and the students start by describing, they write a story. And in the wellness course, they write a story about when they were deeply cared for, they deeply cared for someone else. The stories are amazing. It's about caring for a grandparent with Alzheimer's disease. It's about dealing, growing up with a mother with depression and what that was like. It's about, um, some of them are about dealing with their own mental illnesses and overcoming anorexia or, um, or post-traumatic stress disorder they had from a childhood experience. And so when I read these stories, it's just, I'm amazed. I had no idea. And I used the same assignment um, asking students to write about their experience with substance use disorder when I was at IU, graduate psych NP students. And um, they no, no one ever said, I don't have a story to write. Everybody had either a personal story or a family story or a friend who had had some sort of substance use disorder and how um, talk about emotions, the anger, the resentment, the self-loathing, the, um, and so that that's the describe. And then what I do with this, you can do it different ways is I do the exam and the E and the articulation of learning at the end of the semester, because during the semester, 
they read, they get different perspectives, they expand their thinking, and then they examine it, um, the story, they go back and look at that same story after reading all the literature and integrate the literature, and then they are able to articulate their learning and talk about why that matters. That's transformative learning. That's transformative learning. So um, students also write a commitment to change paper. Those are very common. They do videos so that some of them don't like to write or they're not good writers, so they can do video assignments. They have group discussions. Um, we have healing circles. If they want to come and participate in a circle, they can do that instead of writing a paper. And then they do self-care logs. To, um, they, they're supposed to pick one practice that they want to do to demonstrate how they're caring for themselves, and they commit to doing that over the course of the semester um, and build in um, self-compassion when they're, they're not able to meet their goal. But, um, but it's made such a difference in our students. So in closing, I just wanted to um, close with Jean's nursing's work today, again, requires strong voices of being in the world, courageously and convincingly conveying a new proclamation for reform in the personal, political, public, and social thinking and acting of our time. Um, we are in very political times. <laughs> and um, I, I think um, we're naive if we if we don't acknowledge that. And finally, um, one of my favorite inspirations is um, Sister Joan says, do something, just do something. When you see injustice, you cannot unsee it. So even any small acts we can do, um, I keep my head above water. I have a mantra that every day I get up, I say, what's within my sphere of influence today? What's within my sphere of influence today? Because it's so easy. Um, as a, as a dean, as a faculty member, as an administrator, to get overwhelmed by all the external forces impinging on us every day. But um, when we can break it down to one or two things that are within our sphere of influence um, in any given day, then we, we are doing something and we're moving the dial. So thank you. And I look forward to being with my colleagues on the panel. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. You can yep. okay. stay up here if you want. <clears throat> wow. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so the past hour, you've heard quite a bit about compassion. Um, as you know, compassion is considered the crux of nursing. However, we're not here just to talk about nursing. So compassion literally means to suffer together. Among emotion researchers, it is defined as the feeling that arises when you are confronted with another suffering and feel motivated to relieve that suffering. Um, pointed out in the model, and that was fantastic, but compassion is not the same. We must stress that compassion is not the same as empathy or altruism, though the concepts are related. Compassion in nursing is defined as an open hearted awareness of suffering coupled with the desire to relieve the suffering of others. Compassion is considered a verb. It is not a thought or a sentimental feeling, but it is rather a movement of the art. So I loved the Sister Joan, do something, do something. Just don't think about it, get up and do something. Compassion is not exclusive, however, to the nursing profession. It is rather interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and involves everybody. It is a core tenet here of the mission of Sacred Heart University. Compassion is what makes us all human. I liked, um, in the beginning, Joan just calms you down, doesn't she? I was like, well, and then when she finished, I was like calm, just listening to her voice. But she spoke about the sacred work. Um, and I personally believe here at Sacred Heart, we do sacred work. Um, so we are, uh, multidisciplinary. And with that, I will call up the panel. I'll tell you a little bit about each person and we will dive into that. Dr. Bowers, Dr. Donna M. Bowers is a clinical professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Associate Dean of Faculty and New Initiatives for the College of Health Professions here at Sacred Heart. She is responsible for faculty development, curricular um, initiatives within the College of Health Professions. 
Donna joined Sacred Heart University in 1997 after 13 years as a PD physical therapist, which I never knew. Well, till recently. She currently continues her pediatric practice and has extensive experience across multiple pediatric settings, including early intervention, schools, hospital step-down nursery, and outpatient practice. She is a fellow of the American Physical Therapy Association Education Leadership Institute. She previously served on the Pediatric Specialty Council of the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties and has served as a member of the Specialization Academy of Content Experts in the area of pediatrics. Additionally, um, Donna serves as the university liaison to our RISE Transition Program, providing oversight of the SHU Buddy Program for fitness and social activities for young adults with neurodiversity. Um, she serves as a board member of the CES Foundation, which supports teachers' initiatives and development, and she annually leads interdisciplinary service learning experiences in Guatemala. When I tried to hook her up for this panel, she was in Guatemala. <laughs> so welcome, Donna. Next up, Professor Colin Petromali. He is the coordinator of Community Partnerships, Faith and Justice at Sacred Heart University. His position combines work from campus ministry and volunteer programs. He earned his master's in theological studies from the University of Dayton and has previously worked as a retreat leader and teacher. His passion lies in making faith real for everyday people. Regardless of religious tradition, Colin sees compassion as a hu central human vocation. Welcome, Colin. And Amanda Davis, who snuck out of class to be here with us. She is one of our superstar uh, second degree accelerated nursing students here at SHU. She attended University of New Haven and graduated in the year 2020 with a degree in criminal justice and a degree in national security before she decided to switch gears. She took a few turns along the way, and although um, she loved what she studied, she decided to pursue nursing was the right path for her. Amanda did share with me when I had interviewed her um, and already previously said, uh, Karen said, she has traveled over 20 countries, uh, which I know I was personally impressed with and consider her now somewhat of a global pioneer. Her hopes as a, as a future nurse, most definitely in August, are to work with oncology patients in her home state of New York City. Welcome, Amanda. So being cognizant of the time, um, what we would like to do is if each person could provide a, a short answer to the questions, if you don't want to or want to skip, you can certainly do so as well. We're pretty easy going here. Um, Nick had mentioned um, probably the number one question that everybody thinks about, you know, and we have so many problems here in the US, why should we be concerned about showing compassion to people in other parts of the world. Do you want to each address that? Colin's on the end. We'll make him go. Yeah, yeah. You're up, Colin. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Sue. It's great to be here with everybody today and to, uh, to hear our lovely speakers and the wisdom that, that we bring to this conversation. Uh, in terms of um, I first read that question about why I care about um, what's going on across the world when we have we have many issues that are happening here in the United States. Um, it, it seems to me at, at first glance to, to be a bit of a false dichotomy to create. And, um, one of the things I heard today that I, I, I try to live by is that when one of us is suffering, um, each of us is suffering. And that crosses political, um, socio-political boundaries in a way that um, that really defines, uh, that really um, baffles the mind, but also challenges the heart to greater types of love and compassion across our, across our world. So when we think about um, why pay attention to these, to these issues that are happening in the larger world, for me, it, it really just comes back to this modern nation state system that, that we all kind of live within. It's, it's a modern creation. Um, and I, I believe that part of our, our vocation to compassion is, um, is really to not pay as much attention to the, to the boundaries that we've created between one another, but to the, 
to the humanity among one another. And so the humanity that connects us all. Um, so I'd love to hear what perhaps Dr. Donna has to say. So she's back in the line. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sarah. That was all the healthcare profession, everything you said that make it an educator and disability as well as a profession. So when I first heard this question, you know, I'm I am a I'm an Irish Italian, right? Just so you know, so my immediate reaction is, is gut and emotional reaction. I'm like, well, why can't we do all of that? Right? Why why do we have to have this hard line separating local service and global service. And I think for me, I then, you know, I take a step back, I have to think and reflect. And I started thinking about my students and I do a lot of service in our community here as well as internationally in Guatemala. And I thought to myself, it's, it's somewhat easier and a way for students to start thinking about their compassion to see something that is starkly different from their own experience. So going to Guatemala, taking them and serving them in Guatemala is a way to open their eyes, but they bring that, they, they bring that experience back with them and it translates to service on the local level. And, and for me, I've seen students really transform within a week being in Guatemala with them. But then when they come back, they take that fire that was started in the belly, and we then translate it. And you know, I then have students, not always the same students, but they translate that to what can we do in our own backyard? What you know, what are the issues that are facing, particularly in, in a country where the health care of someone, myself growing, you know, in Fairfield, my children raised in Fairfield, might be starkly different from a family whose health care is in Bridgeport. Or, or somewhere else in Connecticut. Um, I think helping the students' eyes be opened to differences allows them to see it in our own world. So I still go back to we can do both, and we can do both when we need it. Yeah, I, I think COVID has taught us that, <laughs> that we're all connected. And, and maybe didn't teach us, but it should have reminded us that it didn't. Didn't teach us. Um, I, I had a son living in um, South Korea at the time, and um, he called me in January 2020 and said, "There's this horrible virus coming, on. horrible, and it's coming. No matter what, what are we gonna do?" <laughs> and I, that was like, "Well, I don't, you know." It took me off guard, and I, I realized through looking back how much more aware living in in the eastern part, how much more aware. He was of what, and if we would have paid attention to that and listened to that, what a difference. And um, maybe the other comment I want to make is I recently was heard the term pluralistic possibility. I heard about the complementary nature of things and that we need to move away from dichotomies, but pluralistic possibility is I think what we're all emphasizing is that we can hold more than one truth. We can work for more than one truth. So um, I think um, my new endeavor is. Uh, exploring more deeply um, pluralistic possibilities and how we can bring those into our teaching and into our students' minds and thinking. So when I first heard that question, my immediate thought was, why not? I feel like we use a lot more energy not being compassionate towards others than we do than being compassionate towards others. I think compassion is an innate experience. I think we were born with that innate. If you Trace back to early tribes. Um, I recommend reading the book Tribe by Sebastian Junger. It's fantastic. You learn that that's part of us, and your initial reaction is to be compassionate. You know, for a small example, when someone drops something on the floor, you immediately pick it up. That is like the most minuscule example, but it's all inside of us. I also think that it's so easy to get caught up in your own life. We're very also self centered individuals. That's also another innate thing about us. So I think being mindful of other things that are going on in the world helps us to get out of that selflessness, if that makes sense. And it kind of keeps us grounded that we're not the only human beings here, but we're not the only living creatures here. Um, so I think that's really important. Beautiful, thank you. 
Um, and I do agree. It's, it's the little acts. And there's so much we can do in our own backyard. You don't have to wait for the global trips to come. Um, this weekend, I know we are bringing some nursing students to a, a Baptist health fair all day Saturday, and then on Sunday, a PD one. I don't know too much about PD, except both of my children are alive, you know, and I, I raise them. Um, but I'm going. I'm going. You know, you got to get out of your comfort zone and you have to try to give back. <laughs> Um, being cognizant, again, of the time, I want to give the audience opportunity uh, to ask some questions. So I'm just going to ask if we could quickly go through this question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. If you had to say one thing, what can one person, one individual person do to demonstrate compassion to people locally and globally? And is it possible to create a connected um, global community? You can go in whatever order you want. Um, I think just being present with people, you mentioned Brene Brown, and a quote of hers always resonated with me was, you can't always fix someone's problems, but you can sit in the dark with them. And that always just resonated with me. And I had a patient recently who got really poor news of a cancer prognosis. And I said to him, I said, listen, I can't fix what's going on, but I can just sit here with you. And I just think that speaks volumes. Um, obviously, that's a little bit harder to do here globally. I think globally, the best thing we could do is go abroad and expose ourselves. But I think locally, just being with people in silence and um, through acts, but I just think silence and just being in the presence of others is, is amazing and really beneficial. You're hired in August. And <laughs> Yeah, I go back to, to Sister Joan and just do something. Um, my doing something is I have a um, a homeless man that lives for, um, on the corner. And the owner of Steve's Snapping Dogs um, lets him sleep there at night on the stoop because there's an electrical plug. And so he can plug his cell phone in. He has a, a little oven, like a toaster oven. And so he cooks there at night. And then he packs everything up and puts it behind the dumpsters during the day. And he's from Iran and I've gotten to know him. And it's through Sister Joan that I I'm s got to know him as a person, a human being. And he knows my whole family now. And we um, help him in little ways that we can. But I think to see people, to see their humanity, just acknowledge their humanity. It doesn't have to be about giving money. Um, it can just be seeing someone's humanity has made made such a difference. So now you know, when he sees me, he's like, hey, sister, I can't remember, you can't remember our name, but he calls me sister. And um, I stop and talk to him a couple times a week. And honestly, some days I don't have time to stop and talk talk to him. So I go a different way around the block. But I do take time a couple times a week to stop and see him and see me. But, um, I don't know what it's like for you around here, but I'm in two cities, Denver and San Francisco, and they are both they have such homeless problems and it's just absolutely heartbreaking um but um to do what we can you can see the humanity of other people it's so important so i think the answer to this question um stems from what you were saying what you were saying what um nicholas was saying what oh, i say and i think it's it's listening it's listening and um being present, um, a witness to somebody's pain, a witness to somebody's um, situation, you know, just by being with somebody and listening, you can validate their existence, you can validate who they are. You talk about the whole person, you know, in, in PT, we think about caring for the whole person and movement is part of the whole person. So, you know, it's, it's validating them and their existence. And then the second, you know, from that, I think, as Joan said, do something. So Joan said, do something. You know, one little act, small acts, to take your words, small act is, is a stone in a pond. It causes ripples. And those ripples, you know, if you do small acts in one pond and then another pond and another pond, you start having outwardly moving ripples that really start to make a bigger impact. So that would be my well, it's been a great privilege of, of this semester for me to teach in uh, 
which has a conceptual tradition. And one of the questions that comes up consistently, I love this when students bring this up, um, why do good people suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? And I remember in my, in my own life, I was, uh, it was November of, of 2011, actually, I was a senior in high school and I had experienced a loss at the time. And I remember the very first moment that I asked that question in a real place of pain. I think probably all of us have done that was before at some point in our lives, perhaps a few points. And it was a late fall night. And I was in, in the car as my mom had picked me up after, after school. And I remember looking at the trees and thinking, there's not a lot of trees. There's, there's no way that this could happen. Uh, that this kind of loss and pain exists in the world and there's a God of love behind this. But I remember in that moment that it was the beginning of, of compassion for me. That for some reason, I don't know why, but I think about this often. I thought of a woman, faceless woman, in sub-Saharan Africa, who was experiencing loss and experiencing uh, what I was experiencing and maybe was struggling to get clean water for her children. Maybe was had to walk miles and get clean water for her children. And again, maybe had experienced much more significant things than what I had experienced coming from the privileged background that I come from. And I just wondered about that woman. That woman still haunts me. I never put a face to that. But I've thought since then that whenever we talk about this question of why bad things happen to good people and why there is suffering in the world, um, I've learned from, from my faith and I think from some of my, my role models that what we can do to be compassionate is in the middle of that uncertainty about why things happen, um, to refuse, to gently refuse the lure of hatred in favor of compassion. To gently refuse the lure of hatred um, in favor of compassion. And I think that that's even what we're struggling with when we talk about politics right now is just, well, if, if you listen to this person, well, I know everything about you. I don't know. I should just listen to you and hear what, hear what you have to say. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Questions from Karen will run around like Vanna White, as well as myself. Um, questions from the audience. No. Another Vanna, okay. Well, if there's no questions, we will give you our big announcement and then we'll come back around if anybody wants to um, ask questions of the panelists. Karen? Just watching the time, yeah. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I hope you've um, enjoyed this fifth annual, <clears throat> excuse me, this fifth annual dialogue on compassion. It always leaves you with a lot to think about. And just, um, just Colin, when you were saying why bad things happen to good people. So many years ago, um, after leaving, um, um, several years working in uh, oncology critical care. I did a little bit of work in, in hospice. And I remember going to an annual conference of the National Hospice Organization. And uh, the guest speaker then was Rabbi Harold Kushner, who wrote Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And I, I have to say, he said something really shocking, shocking, uh, at that conference and he said he would prefer to think of a, rather than think of a loving God that allows bad things to happen, his preference was to think of a God that was perhaps less omnipotent in what happened, but who suffered and cried along with the rest of us. And, you know, interesting, you know, having been raised Catholic, the thought of a divine being who is not omnipotent, uh, I really struggled with, um, and I still struggle with. 
So best for me, how I reconcile that is um, we don't know why bad things happen to good people, but I'm convinced uh, that God feels their pain. So I just wanted to add that. So um, here is the uh, brief announcement that Sue and I uh, want to share on behalf of Dr. Daly and everybody in the Davis and Henley College of Nursing that we are pleased to announce that um, starting with this coming academic year, we're going to award $10,000 in grant funding for research on compassion research. And uh, there will be additional details forthcoming, but this uh, was long the dream of ours when the center started. We are hoping that it will become at some point um, an official university recognized center at some point so that we can continue to do more than provide an annual dialogue, but we are awarding up to $10,000 in grant funding for research on compassion. And again, look for your emails, uh, details will follow. And uh, if there are no questions, there were no questions uh, online, just other than a great presentation, thank you so much. Um, it's almost three, right? And we have a hard stop. So on behalf of Sue and myself, we thank you all for attending this fifth annual dialogue. And as I said, we hope um, you leave with something to, to think about. And uh, to all the members of our panel, thank you so much. And Sue, final words. Oh, just in closing, I guess sister would want me to say that. Think of an actionable item of just doing something, no matter how small it is. Um, it doesn't have to be grandiose. Get out there and do something because compassion is a verb. Um, I